Coming up on DTNS, why iPhone users suddenly love widgets, Facebook plans for a chaotic U.S. election, and robots and satellites from Microsoft Ignite. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And a very tired Patrick Beja from the forests of Finland. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just uh, talking with Patrick about uh, the Xbox and the orders and 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 wanting physical discs versus not wanting physical discs. Uh, Sarah was talking about her her camera setup. We got all kinds of good stuff on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, now a note to Seamus Lavery. We probably won't talk about Battery Day today, but if there's something big comes out of it, we'll definitely talk about it tomorrow, Seamus. Yes, I got all your messages. All right, <laughs> now a few tech things you should know. There are nine different sizes of Apple's new Solo Loop Apple Watch bands because they don't have clasps. Mac Rumors reports that customers who got the wrong sized band are told they must send the entire watch back, not just the band, because it's considered a set. Some users have reported being able to exchange just the band in the store. Google's Area 120, I think we should say 12.0. It should be 12.0. <laughs> Google's Area 120 introduced Tables, a work tracking tool that automates email reminders for overdue tasks, chat messages from new form submissions, and moving and updating tasks. Tables can import data from spreadsheets, share data with Google Groups, and assign tasks to Google Contacts. Tables is available now with both free and paid plans. Jabra announced the Elite 85T wireless earbuds for $229. The Elite 85T have a six microphone array for voice calls, four mics are used for active noise canceling features, and one two millimeter drivers for improved sound. Jabra claims 5.5 hours of continuous listening with noise canceling on and 25 hours more or 25 hours more with the case. Pre-orders start next month, shipping in November. I want them. AMD announced the Athlon 3000 C series and the Ryzen 3000 C series processors for Chromebooks. Some of the specs of these chips are identical to chip designs that are already found in Acer's Aspire 5 and Dell's Inspiron 15, but AMD says it wanted to rebrand the chips as Chromebook-specific CPUs. Royal uh, was one of the first companies to show off a foldable screen device at CES 2019 and has announced its latest foldable. The FlexPi 2 tablet has 5G and Snapdragon 865 or 865 chipset and a 4550 <laughs> hour battery. The FlexPi 2 is available, available for 9,999 yuan, about 1,400 170 US dollars. Walmart announced a partnership with Quest Diagnostics to deliver at home COVID 19 kits by drone. Uh, that trial is live right now in North Las Vegas and will launch in Chictawaga, New York in early October. After a temporary suspension on paid extensions this year due to fraudulent transactions, Google has announced that over the next several months, paid Chrome extensions are out of there, cease to be available. Developers haven't been able to submit new paid extensions since back in March, and the free trial option offered by the Chrome Web Store will also go away on December 1st. Devs who still want to monetize their extensions must migrate to another payment processor and a new licensing API. And Microsoft just announced it has exclusively licensed OpenAI's GPT-3 language model. That's the one that auto-generates text. We talked to Andrew Main about it. Uh, OpenAI, re OpenAI released GPT-3 in July. OpenAI says, quote, the deal has no impact on continued access to the GPT-3 model through OpenAI's API. Uh, so, so you're not losing access if you've been using it. Microsoft isn't stealing it away. What Microsoft says it's getting is the access to the underlying code of GPT-3. So the API is going to stay the way it is. All right, Patrick, let's talk a little more about widgets. Indeed, uh, iOS 14 brings widgets to Apple's phones for the first time, something Android has had since uh, time immemorial or when it launched in 2008. iPhone users are creating tons of viral videos and images on platforms like TikTok and Instagram. An app called Widgetsmith, an app for making widgets, was the top free app on iOS on Monday. 
Number two was Caller Widgets. Widget apps have been installed about 5 million times since iOS 14 was released on September 16. Yeah, I put this in here because uh, a it's it's a it's a crazy trend that's happening where everybody's like sharing their like look what I've done with my iOS home screen it looks nothing <laughs> like iOS right it's so customized <laughs> yeah uh, and and then immediately followed by three Android people scoffing at them like I've had this forever <laughs> uh, which is true I I've never been much of a widget person on the Android side you know I've used some headline stuff and a clock and this and that but I actually just prefer to like. Make, make it easy to get to my apps. So the widgets I've been using on iOS are the one that actually suggests the apps you might want to use next, because I find that really handy to just have that on the home screen. It reduces the amount of times I have to go into the drawer uh, and all that sort of stuff. And, and then uh, I've been trying the one where it, in the corner, it just either shows you the weather or some news headlines or photos and, and just seeing how that works. But I haven't done much like true customization like some of these people have. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, and I I only installed iOS 14 yesterday, so there's some time yet for me to get used to all the cool stuff that I can use, and not just use iOS how I've been using since 13 came out, which just seems like a long time now. But I I find that everything that's on my home screen, and I'm gonna sound like somebody who just is resistant to change. Everything that's on my home screen is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. I swipe down and there's a lot of, you know, my frequently used apps. If there's an app that isn't either on my home screen or in recent used, you know, the first couple of letters, then it comes up because I have so many pages of apps, I wouldn't know where it was otherwise. So it's, it works for me, but it is a little chaotic. So I see where widgets can uh, simplify stuff and give more precedence to the things that I really do use the most, like the weather app type thing. I'm looking at that all the time. Am I, you know, do I need the Uber app on my home screen? No. So I did a little rearranging this morning. So that's at least a good uh, thing that came out of this is me kind of being like, well, what's really important? Maybe I don't need so many apps on my home screen, but I'm telling you the widgets, even the small ones, they really push a lot of stuff out. So I, I have to figure out what, because I don't care if it looks cool and customized, really. I, I don't know how much I care about that. I don't care about colors. And maybe that's just me not oh. being a cool TikToker. I do care a little bit about the colors and design, especially, you know, uh, iOS has been starved for customization since it launched. And I think this is why you're seeing the explosion of all of this, because you can make it a little bit more your own. Um, so I did go and download the, uh, which one is it? The Widgetsmith app and it it's pretty cool it lets you do widgets and i thought okay it's free maybe you can pay for it to to get more features because the amount of app uh, of widgets you can add is pretty limited but there's a subscription it's not a one time payment it's a subscription that you have to pay to add different widgets and that's where i was like okay this is bs i I'm, I'm stopping this right here iOS is going to stay the way it's always been, which has been fine and functional. Well, but, you can get um, other widgets without having to pay Widgetsmith. But yeah, that's the one everybody's yes. using to really customize, like tur turning their screen into Windows 95 icons and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a pretty cool app, but it's just that, that you know, I would pay for it. Subscription, though, it's like I have mm. enough of those. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, well, if you have a really cool home screen that you'd like to share with us, <laughs> um, uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com would be a great place to start. Love to see him. All right, so we've had a day to get used to the idea that Microsoft will acquire Bethesda. We know it increases Microsoft's game studios from 15 to 23. We know that Microsoft said that it will let Beth Bethesda run as its own division. It means marquee titles beyond Forza and Halo. So, Patrick... What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's it's a little bit more than Bethesda. It's Zenimax, of which Bethesda is one studio. There are a few others, but um, it's it's really interesting. I think it shows. It's a, first of all, obviously, it's a gigantic move by Microsoft. It's a really important one. Until now, they had bought uh, well-known studios, but they were more in the double A. Uh, space than the really big productions AAA uh, type of games and now this is Microsoft saying all right we know we've been saying it's good to have games on all platforms and to be and now it's exclusives that's what matters and of course 
Microsoft is not really playing the same game as everyone else has been playing for the longest time because they want you to play their games on any platform you can, but it's still, in a sense, their own platform because it's the Game Pass and it's the games they publish, so it's their things. And I very much suspect that most of the big games that are going to be coming out of Bethesda and those other studios are not going to be on any other platform. They could publish them on PS4, uh, PS5, I mean. Um, I don't see that happening for the big, big ones. Of course, they're going to be on PC and Xbox, but those are going to be reasons to get the Game Pass. Uh, if they could have gotten Game Pass on PlayStation or on uh, Nintendo, which Microsoft said initially, well, we'd love to do it. And a few months ago, they said, ah, apparently Sony is not interested. So, um, and Nintendo neither. But so it, it, they're going to put these big games as a uh, an incentive for people to get Game Pass. And that's a form of exclusivity. You know, I, it makes me wonder, because that all makes sense, and I think you're absolutely right. But the Microsoft approach outside of gaming has been, we're the cloud provider. Whatever gets you to use our stuff and therefore our cloud services, we like. So we don't care. We're going to put Android on our Microsoft Surface Duo. Uh, we're going to put our stuff out on iOS. Uh, we've, we've changed. We're not trying to lock you in. I wonder if at any point this makes it possible for them to move to do that in gaming, which is we make money when people buy games. And so we want to put the games out wherever. And Game Pass is their Azure in that calculation and maybe they even use this as a as some leverage to say gosh if you if you put game pass nintendo sony on your console you'll get access to all of these exclusives you know i i don't know it's it's interesting i'm not saying they're yeah. going to do it but it raises the question i mean i i don't think they're not going to put any games on any other platform they do put out uh, ori and the blind forest and the will of the wisps on the nintendo switch so they're not opposed to having that the Game Pass proposition is a little bit different because then it encourages players to not purchase other games as much. Um, if So if Sony puts it on their system, yes, they might get some money from the Game Pass subscription, but then they lose money on other games that won't be purchased because everything is on Game Pass. Um, it's I think it's a little bit of different because if they just start putting every game out on other platforms on their own, then they're a games publisher. They're not a games, you know, platform anymore. They just publish games. So yeah. I, I think they're still going to pull back on that aspect. Yeah, like they're a software publisher, not a operating system platform. Well, I mean, I, I, I know we have to move on, but they have just changed. They have dematerialized the platform. It used to be a hardware box. Now it's their Game Pass service, but it's still a platform. And they want people to use that platform instead of any other. Facebook's head of global affairs and former UK Liberal Democratic Party leader Nick Clegg, also former Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, told the Financial Times that Facebook is prepared to, quote, restrict the circulation of content, end quote, on and after Election Day in the United States. Clegg said, quote, there are some break glass options available to us if there really is an extremely chaotic and worse still violent set of circumstances. He did not give details on what this would mean, uh, but we can look at what Facebook did in Sri Lanka and Myanmar in the past, where the company reduced the reach of content from rule breakers and limited the distribution of sensationalist borderline content uh, during chaotic elections there. A source said Facebook has studied 70 different potential scenarios. High-stakes decisions will be made by a team of executives that includes not only Clegg, but Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg, and, of course, CEO Mark Zuckerberg, who will have veto power over any decisions. Facebook has set up an election operations center to monitor activity during the election. So they appear to be taking the problem seriously this time around and not just reacting on election night anyway, but but trying to prepare for possible consequences. You know, the thing that bothers me about this is the on and after election day part of this. Yes, you should be restricting content that is inciting riots, you know, and and creating chaotic scenarios for, for people. But wouldn't you want to do that before an election? Not you know, after an election starts upsetting a bunch of people because maybe they read a bunch of junk on Facebook. 
you know, it's it's I, this is me taking Facebook to task a little bit, and it's not the only social network that has this problem, but it feels like, oh yeah, things get really bad, then we'll kind of, you know, kick into high gear here. I think it's a little bit, uh, you're right. They're, they sh should, they could, and maybe should be doing more before the election. But I also think that after the election, it becomes easier to act on things because the uh, threshold for something going wrong is easier to detect. I think what you know, no one is saying, but everyone is thinking, is the scenario where uh, President Trump loses the election and then uh, contests the results in a way that could lead to uh, unrest. And, and that is a lot more clear cut than having to decide before the election what is or isn't, uh, you know, uh, okay for it to be on on the Facebook platform. Yeah. Um, I also That's think it's a... It, it's a little bit scary to to see all of this, but I think it's incredibly important that everyone is prepared for something like that at Facebook. And I really hope that Twitter and, you know, any social media, and I include YouTube in that category, uh, is preparing for those scenarios. I think it's really important. Yeah, the, the, the last thing I want to add to this is I, I imagine what Facebook would say is we're taking preparations for election problems now, right? Which you may or may not think they're taking enough uh, election preparations now. But there is a there is something to the idea that the more you restrict content, the more you restrict content accidentally that shouldn't have been. And so I think what they're saying, what they're trying to say is we don't we don't think it's worth restricting the amount of content accidentally that tougher restrictions would do now because it doesn't really stop that much. But if it got really bad, we'd go ahead and sacrifice that those that accidental restriction to stop really damaging stuff. Just, just trying to get into the other side of what they might be thinking there. Well, the most popular messaging apps in most parts of the world are WhatsApp or Telegram. In China, it's WeChat. But Tech in Asia has a report that in Vietnam, it appears to be a local app called Zalo. In fact, Zalo is the third largest app in the country behind Facebook and YouTube, but in front of Facebook's Messenger, Instagram, TikTok, and even Twitter. Zalo has 52 million monthly active users and Zalo Pay use is rising with it. Zalo was designed for Vietnamese users Vietnamese users with free stickers compatible with Vietnamese language and topic specific chat groups designed for Vietnamese culture. Zalo is made by Vietnam's, Vietnam's first unicorn startup, ZNG, which operates other popular apps like Zing Play. I found this really fascinating because it's an example of taking a market and saying, you know, sure, we could make an app for the rest of the world and try to apply it in every market, or we could focus in on a market and super serve it with what's specific to that market. And I think, yeah. especially in markets outside the US, where you're like, well, I'm looking at all these American made apps and they don't really work for me, but I guess I could make them work. Uh, that can be very compelling. I think there there has to be a need for something like that. In this case, it seems like the um, the, the language issue was something that was a, an unserved need or it didn't work as well in the other apps. Um, I also wouldn't be surprised if maybe uh, they tried to expand to countries that are geographically close to them. It's surprising how sometimes that, even in a digital world that is, you know, that has no barriers and frontiers, sometimes that's how it works. And countries that are neighboring are more likely to adopt these kinds of apps. I don't, I don't know that this is going to happen here. Um, but it happens a lot in Africa as well. Some apps are very successful there and uh, expand to other countries that are uh, uh, close by. Yeah. Now, it would be interesting. Like, would, could this expand into Thailand? Could this expand into Myanmar? I, it, it's, that's a very interesting question. I'll be, I'll be interested to see if they do that or try to replicate. Like, let's yeah. start a Zalo for Thailand, not take Zalo from Vietnam and put it in Thailand. Or, you know, the startup ZNG that makes Zalo, uh, they're they're clearly onto something. Mm -hmm. 52 million monthly active users might like a few more apps that ZNG makes rather oh, yeah. than having to expand Zalo and that just be your only worldwide model that a lot of other apps use. Mm. Or they just add functionality to Zalo and make it the we WeChat of the, uh, Which it looks like they're doing yeah. a little bit of that already yeah. with pay. Exactly. Yeah. 
BlizzCon has recently taken place in November in Anaheim, California, but like most conferences, it will not happen in person and it will not happen in November. Blizz Blizzard Entertainment announced that it will offer an online-only conference on February 19 and 20th, 2021, and call it BlizzConline. I now, I apologize for making you say that, because I saw on Twitter that you're not taken with that name. <sighs> It, it it hurts me. It's I used to work for Blizzard. I love the company. I love most of the games they make. I think this name is really bad. But yeah, that's not super important. Why? But it, what would you call it? I'm just curious. BlizzCon Online. You don't have to be clever you don't have all to the mash time. It. Just you don't have it. to yes, just, it. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what what do you think? Like I, the fact that you know BlizzCon has had a very strong online presence in the past. Uh, with like a direct TV integration and an online integration, uh, I think makes it uh, probably one of the better conferences to go online because they ha they have a lot of experience at delivering their content online. This is taking it up another level though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for those who don't know what BlizzCon is, there are many uh, gaming conferences in the world. Uh, this one is probably the biggest private kind of conference, meaning for only one company about only those games. And uh, there is a big keynote uh, presentation where they announce the big games at the beginning of the conference, which is available for everyone to watch for free uh, all over the world. But then you have a couple of days full of conferences that you had to pay for if you wanted to uh, see them and panels and presentations and, and stuff like that to see them if you weren't there. The tickets cost hundreds of euros if you wanted to go there. Um, I think it's it's going to work out pretty well for them because as you said, they've done it in the past. And also it's interesting that they just, you know, they are so used to having that, having that BlizzCon for big announcements that they can't not have it. Like, what are they going to do? They're just going to put out the press release? <laughs> they have to have a big hoopla about the new mm -hmm. games they're going to announce. And uh, this is going to be an important one because people are starved for Blizzard game. It's been years since they had significant releases. So this is hopefully going to be a pretty big one. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Microsoft Ignite is going on. Uh, we're going to whip through a few of the major announcements there, uh, like Azure Orbital that connects satellites to cloud computing. Azure Orbital is a cloud-based satellite data processing platform. If you know AWS's ground station, it's similar to that. Uh, the service connects satellite operators uh, so they can control their spacecraft through the cloud and integrate the data from their satellites with cloud-based storage and processing. So if you're like, well, wait, what does that mean? It can be used for things like weather imaging. Uh, so companies on the ground can take weather images and process them, uh, monitoring equipment at remote locations like oil rigs, ground communications routed through the satellites, makes that easier. You can do it through the cloud. Norway's KSAT uh, will use it for satellite connectivity. Luxembourg's SES is going to use it to provide communication services. Other partners include Viasat, Emergent Technologies, Kratos, CubeOS, and US Electrodynamics. Microsoft touted its software design modem that lets it bring data off satellites into Azure data centers without needing to add specialized hardware as a big advantage. And select Microsoft customers will be invited to use it in private preview. This is such a fascinating aspect of uh, cloud technology in general, but cloud infrastructure. Because obviously when you're communicating with an orbital device. Spacecraft, you, you can, yeah. Yes, exactly. You, you, you do need to take into account some things that you're not really worried about when you're just connecting two things that are stationary on the, on the planet. It's interesting that companies, multiple companies now, have had to develop technologies and uh, software and I'm, I'm hardware, I'm guessing, for these kinds of needs. Uh, the, the species is advancing, I suppose. Yeah, so instead of each company having to figure out how to get their data down from the satellite into the cloud, Microsoft's going to provide yeah, a service. Yeah. yeah, they just, yeah. you don't worry about it. Just We'll take care of it. And just send it to yeah. us. We got it. 
Software de design modem. It's all good. Uh, it's, Microsoft it's also announced just, the launch of Premonition, a robotics and sensor platform for disease outbreaks. It was developed in partnership with the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator Program and academic partners like Johns Hopkins University, Vanderbilt University, the University of Pittsburgh, and the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Microsoft's also working with Bayer on understanding vector-borne diseases, so you can apply it to that. It's working on a test site both on its campus in Redmond, Washington, and Harris County, Texas, that's where Houston is, for monitoring mosquito-borne disease. Robotic traps, in this case, detect mosquitoes, identify them, like they recognize the mosquito, and then decide whether to capture them or not. It's been able to identify 10,000 mosquitoes in a night, and scan more than 80 trillion base pairs of genomic material for biological threats. It then can scan for anomalies and make predictions. For example, Microsoft says it found a cow infected with a virus based on what it found inside a mosquito's belly. Put that one together in your head. It's coming into private preview now, but uh, this, this, one, this one's hard to wrap your head around, I think. Yeah, I mean, even though I know it doesn't look like this, my my mind immediately goes to a robot kind of going up to a cow and being like, hmm, you know, with a microscope, <laughs> like, I think you've got a problem, Mr. Cow. But yeah, especially in areas where uh, um, disease outbreaks are because of weather or diet or, you know, all of the above um, are a little bit more endemic. This is very cool. I love the idea of it called premonition as well, because they're robots. And you they know, think for themselves now. Space and robots is what <laughs> Microsoft is into. <laughs> I know. It kind of makes the next one feel a little mundane, but it's got some cool stuff. Microsoft announced new features coming to Teams, uh, not space or robots. Uh, virtual commutes. Reflecting during commute time can increase productivity 12 to 15%, according to Microsoft. But if you're not commuting these days, you don't get that reflective time. So you can schedule a virtual commute on Teams at the beginning and end of your day, starting in the first half of 2021. Meditation breaks in partnership with Headspace can be scheduled as part of your virtual commute or as its own break during the day. Microsoft says maybe like right before you do a big presentation to kind of help you focus. Microsoft says 30 days of Headspace resulted in a 32% decrease in stress in a study. Workplace analytics is providing the ability for managers to get uh, data on workers like after hours collaboration, focus time, meeting effectiveness, cross company connections. All users will be able to use the analytics to get recommended actions for changing their habits to improve productivity and well-being. If you unplug at the end of the day, it's going to give you credit. It'll help you reclaim time to focus, reduce your meeting overload. Features like that are coming in October for managers and rolling out to the rest through 2021. There's also new together mode scenes, coffee shops, conference rooms, auditoriums. And later this year, uh, machine language uh, will scale and center participants better in that together mode. If you're like, what's together mode? It's what they use in the NBA games to, to put everybody together in the stands. Dynamic View is getting custom layouts for how content shows up during presentations. That's where you're standing in front of your presentation on the video. You can point to it. Uh, breakout rooms, the ability to split a meeting into smaller groups, and then you can pop around to the different groups and then bring them back into a larger meeting later. There's also um, recaps, meeting recordings, transcript chat, and files shared in the meetings, chat, and attendee registration with automated emails, streamlined calling view, and new devices, some USB peripherals with dial pads, Microsoft Team displays, which are kind of like an Amazon Echo show, but for Teams. Uh, team panels for outside a meeting space when you get back into the office. Uh, audio codes, Poly and Yealink will all offer affordable Team phones designed for common areas as well. So a bunch of stuff coming to Teams. Well, I hope all the bosses who uh, never really wanted me to uh, take reflection time or meditate during the day mm -hmm. will, um, will understand our new normal and... I'm not talking about you, Tom, but, but, uh, <laughs> Thank you for making that clear. <laughs> but in general, I mean, a lot of this stuff is like, okay, well, it still seems pretty, you know, re regimented. And I, I think a lot of this makes a lot of sense. It totally depends on the team. I don't sure. use teams, so I'm not totally, I'm not totally sure what makes teams better than Slack and vice versa. But I, I think that if I were in a more traditional business environment, uh, working from home for the first time and trying to get used to making sure that my day is as balanced as it was when, you know, we were all going somewhere, this would be some welcome features. 
All right, a few other things from Ignite to wrap up. Microsoft's giant 85-inch Surface Hub 2S will arrive in January 2021 for $21,999.99. Uh, Microsoft claims that the Hub 2S has helped bridge remote teams and central response locations for hospitals, healthcare providers, uh, education uh, organizations are replacing things like whiteboards and projectors with it, even if they're not bringing in classes or bringing in employees. Microsoft announced Azure Communication Services that lets developers add voice, including telephone and video calling, chat and text messages to their apps through a new set of APIs and SDKs. It's very similar to Twilio. Microsoft also offers translation tools through this, and the services are encrypted to meet HIPAA and GDPR standards. Microsoft Edge's browser coming to Linux, finally, starting with the dev channel. First of these these previews will go live in October. A new Outlook for Mac design launches in mid-October. And Machine Learning and Azure Cognitive Services launches Metrics, Advisor, Bot Framework Composer, Automated ML UI, and more to help simplify the creation of new models for companies. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. A lot of Microsoft lovers in there. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. What's in the mailbag today? Oh, Kirill said that our conversation on Amazon Sidewalk reminded him of Helium's IoT network based on the LoRa protocol. Kirill says it looks like Amazon's project is kind of competing with that. This free spectrum at 900 megahertz seems to be the same. They may be using LoRa, but with different protocol on top that supports mesh. Helium's LoRa WAN does not. W -A -N. Another difference is that Amazon doesn't have a program to encourage participation and increase coverage like Helium does. I'm sending this because I heard Sarah wondering who may need this. And you were wondering, Tom, why not just use 5G? The answer is for the same reasons why Helium Network is attractive. For battery powered devices with very low data requirements, long range, and you want to break out of the cell carrier's influence. Thank you, Carol. Good stuff. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, and Reed Fischler. Also, thanks to the very tired but very eloquent, as always, Patrick Beja. <laughs> Patrick, what, where can people find the rest of your work? Thank you. Um, well, I guess one thing to plug would be work insanity. We just talked about how uh, virtual commutes could be good, and that's a drum I've been banging on work insanity for a long time. Well, not commutes, but some kind of taking time to uh, be a little bit less tired <laughs> or take a few breaks and um, things like that are more eloquently put in Work Insanity, a podcast I do with one Tom Merritt that helps you work better, especially in these troubled times. Go check it out, folks. Workinsanity.net. And of course, you can get all of Patrick's stuff at notpatrick.com. Uh, don't forget, Monday, October 5th, we start our Creators Theme Week. We look at how technology has changed and is still changing how people create things. Visual effects, costume and props, narrative game design, and more. You won't want to miss it. It starts Monday, October 5th. And you will be the first to know things like this if you support us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Send us those iOS home screens and other things, too. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>